Snap Studios. First, because she decides it's crazy important to pick the right tchotchke crap for her host parents, we missed a train. We missed a train that we've planned our whole schedule around. And so, standing in a Japanese thunderstorm for an hour and a half waiting for the next train, I try to hold my tongue. I try, even as this salary man grabs me by the shoulder, turns me around, I'm down. Anda, Anda, Kogolin! Now, he looks me dead in the face and vomits. An explosive, unending stream of horror. I, I can even take that. But then I see her slight smile as if to say, I told you. In this, I can't take. Oh, oh, you foresaw an intoxicated person with Ralph on my shoes. You knew this because you're psychic. Thanks for your wisdom. She says, I can't believe you're moving to Kyoto without telling me. And I'm like, I just told you that's the telling part. I asked you to come with me. We get to the next stop, still wet, can't find our friends. Likely because they left after waiting for an hour and a half, decide to stop at this place, get something to eat. Why don't we go to that one over there? I don't care which place we go to. Walk in, not speaking, sit down across from each other, not looking at each other, fuming. And then the ground shakes. That high-pitched groan of wood, that rattle of glass and plates crashes as stuff falls. I'm looking at her, eyes wide, knowing that I'm looking back the same way. The ground feels liquid and we're either going to crash to the floor or the roof is going to fall on us. And I reach out for her, her arms stretched to mine. The screaming starts just as the shaking stops. The almost silence of the few plates continue their topple in the background. Then we're wrapped around each other so tight, I'm squeezing her. She's squeezing me, shaking. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. No, really, I am sorry. Inazan! The manager rushes over to see if we're all right. And I feel silly because... Her casual way means this happens all the time. It doesn't happen all the time in Michigan. We look at her, then at ourselves, knotted together. She sees us and smiles. Kawai so na tatachi. Ah, young love. Today on Snap Judgment, shake, rattle, and roll. What changes when everything starts rocking? My name is Glenn Washington. Turn the volume up to 11. Because you're listening to Snap Judgment. Now then, sometimes the rocking starts, and sometimes you start rocking. For our next story, a special collaboration you are not going to believe, Snap Music Master Pat Masidi Miller drops Snap Nation across the pond. The other pond. Zim Heavy. It sounds like this. It was a rock and roll movement that shook Zimbabwe during the 1970s, and it was huge.
Stadiums, festivals with 60,000 fans going crazy for this rock music. It was popular and it was loud. And the sound echoed through the entire nation. Now to understand what it was, you have to know where it came from. See, in the 1970s, Zimbabwe wasn't Zimbabwe. It was Rhodesia. And to be honest, it was a country in crisis. They had just defected from British colonial rule, but no other country in the world actually recognized them as a legitimate nation. And what's more, it was now under the rule of a white minority government that used an apartheid-like system to oppress and disenfranchise the black majority. And I remember as a kid running around with buckets of water to douse the tear gas canisters that the police were, were, were throw. The tear gas canisters would go and That's Eba Chitambo. He's the founder of one of the biggest groups out of the heavy scene. It was tough. It was tough. We were looked down on and we had to struggle for everything that we needed to do. I remember we played a couple of restaurant gigs that we did in the white areas. Break time, they wouldn't allow us to go into the crowd where to go, like, sit in the kitchen or in the backyard. Guess they thought we weren't good enough to share, like, uh, toilets and things with the white people and that. Only go on stage when it's our set time, and after that, out of the club, we're gone. What would happen if you did try to go there? (laughs) (laughs) You don't try that, huh? First, you'd get kicked. (laughs) You wouldn't, you wouldn't go through the door. The bouncers would kill you if you weren't wicked there. Blacks were confined to their own townships. It was there that Ebba grew up and fell in love with rock and roll as soon as he heard it. My mother had a, a gramophone. You know those wind-up gramophone things? And she brought a Elvis Presley 78 record, those break vinyl things. And I was spending so much time listening to that that she broke it up. <laughs> We had what was called the youth clubs in the in the townships. There was like a couple of guitars. After school, we'd go there to while away time. And when he wasn't practicing guitar, he was at the local township halls where he could watch bands play live. You know, when these other groups used to come around and play in our wood, I'd be there helping them carry the equipment, helping them set up. They would let me into the gig for free. Instead of dancing like the other people, I'd be sitting and watching what they were doing. I used to sit and watch the bassist, and I used to feel very, very bad that I couldn't get hold of a guitar like that. So we ended up building our own from an acoustic guitar. For a bass, Ebba managed to rig up an acoustic guitar with those thick strings used for an upright bass. That, that was my guitar. <laughs> How did it sound? It sounded good. Actually, it sounded good. I'm, I'm, I'm surprised it sounded like that. That's how I learned. And then one night at a local club, watching from the crowd. Uh, the drama was drunk, was too drunk to play. And the people started getting rowdy. So they asked the audience, who can play? I said, I can play, I can play. They said, come sit and play. I'd never, I'd never touched a drum set before. (laughs) So I went and did a few songs with them. I was amazed I could play. They wanted me to continue. I think I did four or five songs and I couldn't carry on because I was actually shaking. How did I do that? (laughs) And that night was the birth of his career as a drummer. He never got formal training. There wasn't any available in his township. And after a while playing with different bands, Eba had decided he wanted to start his own. The sound would be heavy. And the name? Wells Fargo. We did. (laughs) We we had no idea what it was. (laughs) Okay, now you gotta think. Rhodesia, early 70s, Ebba, along with pretty much everybody else in the country, had never heard of the bank. To him, the name Wells Fargo had a completely different meaning. How did he find it? It was a comic book. (laughs) <laughs> it was one of those classic Western shoot 'em ups. In it, Ebba saw a picture of some kind of desperado riding a stagecoach through the Wild West holding a shotgun. And written on the front of that stagecoach, you guessed it, Wells Fargo. 
it was like the out- outlaw side of it. That was the whole idea. And I just liked the name Wells Fargo on, on the stagecoach thing. I liked that. And we used the wheel as, as our logo as well. The name was chosen, and now it was time to find the band members. In came Jose, the guy I'd worked with earlier before in another group. Josie would play lead for rhythm guitar, a man named Handsome, and Ebba would be the lead singer, playing drums at the same time. But for the band to be complete, they still needed somebody to play bass. And then there was a kid called Never. Hello. That's Never. My name is Never Mbofu. Never was like my neighbor, like my next door kid, you know. He used to come to my house, he used to come wake me up and knock on the window, can I borrow your guitar? He learned to play bass on that same makeshift guitar that Ebba used. And that was the beginning of the band. Electric guitars were very, very rare. I think the city council had one electric guitar. They chose to do a circuit of all the townships. At the time, I think it was seven, eight townships. You tell like the club leader, we need to use it for a performance at the club. Then you'd go and put a request and they'd bring the guitar and the amp. After the performance, they take it back and give it to the other township, and there was only one one electric guitar at the time. It was passion-driven. We just had a passion. To us, it was like, you know what? I just want to jump on that stage and play. I can see nobody. I can hear no one. getting a spark when you're playing at the shows you know the audience will just go wild and I think that bounced back to us Wells Fargo's original songs well they were about life and love and having a good time in a racially segregated country Everyone wanted to hear this new music that was blasting out from the black townships. The whites, they choose to come to the township because they were allowed. And while blacks and people of mixed race known as coloreds were restricted to their own neighborhoods, the whites, well, they had mobility. We had uh, audiences of mixed people, whites, blacks, colors, and all. Yeah, it was a cooking pot. It was great. Brother. Even the white bands at the time, they used to come and play in the townships because they could get more people on the black side coming to their gigs. A gig is always better when there's more people. Ooh, we're talking 300 people, three, 400 people. We had to end the gigs at 11, but we used to take them till 6 a.m., working all night. Now, while their songs weren't overtly political, just the act of getting together to play music had real dangers. Outside the townships, in the bush, black guerrilla fighters had taken up arms and declared war, and in the cities, the government took aim at anyone showing signs of opposition. They hated black people getting organized, and with us doing the gigs, it was some kind of organization, because the people used to come to the gigs and we could talk and they could hear the music. You play, you get to notice a few guys, the next time you hear, you know, he's gone to the war. Did you have any friends go off to the war? Yes, a lot. Yeah, it was terrible. For those who would manage to come back, you, you really have to celebrate that you, are, you have come back alive. And if these people came back, you know what, the first thing they want to rejoin again, the, the circle of friends and all that, it was at the shores. You see them, and only when they tell you that, man, man, I was out there in the bush, and every bullet that I could hear shot from a gun was like a beat in my head, like drums. 
The heavy scene, which brought people of all walks of life together, was a threat to the ruling class. At the show, the advantage was that's, that's when you'd meet also a lot of people that you could not meet on the street everywhere. We weren't allowed to be in groups of more than two, three people. We couldn't, we couldn't hold a gig for two people. You try and get permission, they slap you in the face, say, God, well, it's wartime and you can't have uh, people congregating like that. But we went ahead and still did the gigs anyway. We used to listen to uh, Black Sabbath, Deep Purple, The Who, a lot. Uh, ten years after. What about Jimi Hendrix? Oof. <laughs> you know what? Um, Jimi Hendrix's influence was massive. Yeah. Hey Joe, that's the first song we had of Jimi's, and I thought, my God, what is this? I remember. <laughs> hey Joe. What you gonna do with that gun in your hand? Uh, the way you were singing it, the way the drama was, I loved the drumming on that song. The guy was like chopping wood or something. And when he came to the solo part, ah, and it killed me. That killed me, man. <laughs> That record changed everything for us. It helped us to understand the situation better as well. Because here, here was a guy singing about things like that and things that we're not even allowed to talk about. We thought, no, man, we've got to change something here. There's war in the bush. There's guerrillas fighting and all this. But it was not for us as musicians. We were the unifying force. Because as soon as the people see the posters will struggle, they'll come in their hundreds. And we thought, this is, this is what we're good at. This is what we're going to use. And they hated that. Like, uh, there's a time that we played one show in one, uh, like, a residential area. The band played for a full house, and the whole crowd was rocking. Liquor flowing, people dancing, and then the police showed up. They came to Never's side of the stage first and told him to stop the show. I said, look, I'm not even the band leader. The person speak to his Eber, the drummer there. You can go and speak to him. And uh, So you, you went to Eber while Eber is playing and says, stop playing. And he grabbed the drumsticks as he was playing. And when the drums stopped playing, we literally all just stopped playing and the audience looked at the stage what's happening. It's not over. It is never over. Snap Judgment returns with part two of this story in just a moment when the Shake, Rattle and Roll episode continues. Stay tuned. In my house, we don't agree on anything food-wise, except this, Dave's Killer Bread. Why? Because it's awesome. Just look at a loaf, take a slice. It's made of real stuff, delicious stuff, tasty stuff. Look, see, no wonder it's America's number one organic bread. Visit daveskillerbread.com to learn more and look for Dave's Killer Bread in the bread aisle of your local grocery store. Dave's Killer Bread. Bread Amplified. This episode is brought to you by Progressive. Most of you aren't just listening right now. You're driving, cleaning, even exercising. But what if you could be saving money by switching to Progressive? Drivers who save by switching save nearly $750 on average, and auto customers qualify for an average of seven discounts. Multitask right now. Quote today at Progressive.com. 
Progressive Casualty Insurance Company and Affiliates. National average 12-month savings of $744 by new customers surveyed who saved Progressive between June 2022 and May 2023. Potential savings will vary. Discounts not available in all states and situations. Welcome back, Snappers. From the frying pan into the fire on the Snap Judgment Shake, Rattle, and Roll episode. Understand, this story does contain violence. Sensitive listeners are advised. We last left our heroes on stage, surrounded by policemen, demanding that their show come to an end right now. So you you went to Eba while Eba is playing and says, Stop playing! And he grabbed the drumsticks as he was playing. And when the drums stopped playing, we literally all just stopped playing. And the audience looked at the stage, what's happening? And when the officer stepped up to the mic to tell everybody to clear out... Before he could just say anything at all, a, a pint of beer just came to his face, straight like that. Yeah, it was a mess. He fell down and the audience were really like throwing buckles all over the place, filled, filled with the big bus. It was sound like bombs or something, you know what? A full-on riot erupted. After that, people, they knew that, of course, because of this setup, the police will come in numbers. So many people just got into their cars and left. Because of this show, how it ended, it was not nice. We feared for even ourselves and our audience, our fans. Hey, we have to be careful. We didn't feel good about playing the next weekend. So, you know, look, let's just cool out and we'll come back and play. Weeks later, they were back on stage. The show was going on nicely. We were playing on stage, and when I looked right from the foyer side, I saw some people with peak angles in plain clothes, white guys. I thought, okay. Because of our mixed audience, we didn't see that there was a setup. The police had planned a revenge for the night when the cop was hit with a beer. Near 100 officers came to raid the show. Another officer just gave me a huge kick and I just went with my guitar, jumped off stage and straight I was going to the, to the door. But police blocked the door. Anyone trying to escape had to go through a tunnel of baton-wielding policemen. They were like, they were like a machine sawing people there eating. Using his guitar as a shield, never braved the police line and made his way outside. Everybody came out and the dogs were him. The police dogs were on him, trying to tear him up. They had the place surrounded and there were more cops outside waiting. There's two officers who were coming for me. And this guy came screeching his car. And this guy said, never just throw it. I threw in my guitar and I jumped in and they, we sped off. Not only did they have the venue surrounded, They had the township blocked in with dozens and dozens of trucks full of police. They broke my arm and cracked my skull and I I ended up in hospital. Six stitches on my head and all that. I saw blood and everything, people getting wounded and a lot of ladies it was there was they were not sparing anybody everyone was doing anything musicians and all we got a beating there's a lady there was a lady there who was pregnant she lost the baby and all it was frightening it was frightening i didn't understand it even up to today from that whole situation i never received even a scratch I just, I couldn't understand how I had gone through that 
kind of machine and you know it, it was whew. I had a colored friend of mine who came to me later and saying Nev do you see this he had a big gash on his head he said you know what Nev I saw this coming Nev on your way and I put my head in this was meant for you You know, after they had beat you up and all that and you were injured and in the hospital, were you thinking like maybe this music isn't worth it or maybe I should stop? No way. <laughs> I think they made it worse. We were more fired up when we came back. We were more fired up after that. We couldn't stop. <laughs> Two of the guys were like roadies in the band. They had left to go to war. And we really started like agreeing to the reasons why they left. We also got politically conscious. And we tried to integrate it into our music as well. That's how the song came about. Have Gun Will Travel, it was called. This song was called Have Gun Will Travel. It was really, really hard hitting. It was straightforward, straight to the gut. Some of the few lines that I remember, yes. Oh, oh, for wings that I could fly and the sun could touch me, have a gun will travel. No rivers and no mountains will stop me. We'll get there at some point. Uh, watch out, freedom is coming. You better hold on. You better hold on. That's how it was raw like that. <laughs> Trying to record anything like that at the time wasn't, it wasn't possible. The government had a strict censorship board, and a song called Have Gun Will Travel would never make it through. And while they couldn't record it, in stealth, the guys would play it while they performed in the black townships. And the, the people were going wild when they heard it. <laughs> the song spread all through the country by word of mouth, becoming an anthem of the oppressed. People are singing these songs which are not on record. Uh, it, was, it was amazing. All we had to do was just the verses. When it gets to the chorus, the crowd used to do it for us. We never even had to sing those parts anymore. But then we started drawing attention from the wrong side as well. Joseph got arrested for playing it when he went to this new group. The government learned of the song and began the crackdown, sending secret police into shows. Guys will actually come and say, hey, there's a couple of guys in the, in, the, in the gig and we don't trust them. So we'd actually leave the song out of the playlist for the night. So we couldn't play it. We'd get arrested. But we couldn't stop playing it because now it was in the people. The song was in the people and they wanted it all the time. I had to find a way to carry on playing it. They came up with the idea to code the song. Same melody, same arrangement, but with a hidden meaning. I sat down and I changed the lyrics down a bit. I removed the so-called offensive lyrics. Now it was a symbol that we were pushing. The war was now disguised as a big storm. The gun flashes and bombs were thunder and lightning. And when they tried to sneak it past the government censors, it worked. The underground anthem, Have Gun, Will Travel, became their radio hit, Watch Out. Watch out, big storm is coming, the thunder and lightning, you better hold on. Watch out, big storm is coming. 
now it was on radio every household and uh, it was awesome the song was just everywhere the bass line on that song people would sing it when i walk around the street when they see people will say good because if you listen to it it's just going that one way and sitting on that one not And for me, it was great because I'm thinking that, hey, <laughs> at least I think I've done something. There's one time that uh, in 1976, at the Trade Fair rock band competition, it was packed, 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 packed. And it was big time, big time. It was a, yeah, it was massive. We started just playing, we started playing Wash Out. The excitement was too much. The people jumped over the fence and everything. The security guys were overwhelmed. They could not do anything. They were all over the stage trying to lift you while you are playing. The amplifiers are shifting and stuff. And <laughs> it was, it was uh, to control it, we had to stop the music. Literally, we didn't even play the other songs. And we won that competition. We played one gig and there was some tourists from the States and he comes up to me and tears a, a leaf from his checkbook and he writes best spend in the world and he gave it to me and I looked and it was a Wells Fargo bank check and I said, oh, this is a bank? <laughs> the interesting thing, you could see that the fans, they were free in those situations. It was like you had a festival at the stadium, you'd come and spend time with people, sit down, talk to them, they get to know you, you get to know them, we and we got to understand each other better that way. Before that, to them, they wouldn't even tell the difference between me and the other black guy. To them, we were just the same thing. You know? So I think the music brought the people together. Then they started understanding that we individuals, we, we, we might be black, but we individuals just like them. Music is not always just about the instruments that we play, no matter how well you play the stuff. Sometimes you can play so well underneath. It's nice to do that. But that, you know, also the instruments are just a vehicle of what the message in the song is. We built a, some kind of following, so I think we got to the people we wanted to get to through the music. It could have been our part in the liberation of the country against the, the oppression that was there at that time. In 1980, the Rhodesian government fell and the country of Zimbabwe, as we know it today, was born. And alongside dignitaries and official ceremonies, the Zimbabwean government threw a huge concert with one very special performer, Bob Marley. He sang his song, Zimbabwe, a gift to the people of the country. Uh, after, after that, it's, it sort of fizzled out. The heavy music sort of fizzled out. Like new roots music came in. This was what was going down now. Another new style of music had become popular, chimaranga, which was based in the sound of traditional Zimbabwe. It was now more like back to your roots and people started going traditional. More African music than, than European music. And if you went to Zimbabwe today and asked a random person on the street about the country's rock movement, What's up? you'd hear this. Any one of you, would you tell me about the rock music of the 1970s in Zimbabwe? Mm. Ah, yeah, yeah, yeah. Come on, come on, come on, come on, come on. 1970s. Nobody. Mm. Anyone who knows about rock music, come, come. Ah, you don't know anything. <laughs> Serious. But years later, while the musicians that once filled stadiums are playing part-time gigs on the weekend. One day at the 
playing some uh, with, with some other group we're doing some kind of jazz thing a guy came up to me and he walks up to me and says why don't you play watch out and I laughed and said what he says why don't you play watch out no, no, not in this situation. He says, you know what, that song made us go to war. You guys came and played our, at our school, and after that, me and about 40 guys left the school one night, and we crossed over, and we went to war because of that song, and we were singing it all night when we were crossing over. Ah, it, you know, it felt very, very good. It was such a nice feeling when you said that to me. And I just had the news that George had passed away, the guy that was our guitarist. And it brought tears to my eyes when, when, when I started singing that song. So now, like, every time I get a gig, it's a regular thing. I have to play that song. <laughs> Watch out! Big storm is coming! Fargo. That's right. You like it. You dig it. I'm glad to tell you the revolutionary anthem Watch Out has finally been given a proper release. Get the record they never got to drop. It's called Watch Out and it's available right now through Vinyl Me Please. It's got music that you heard in this story along with a bunch of other great songs and I'll tell you what. The record's awesome. Big thanks to Eva Chitambo and Never Mbofu for sharing their story with Snap. Rock on fellas. Our correspondent on the ground in Zimbabwe was Albert Nyati. And a big thank you to Matthew Schechmeister for all of your help. Check out the work that Matthew and the good people at Now Again Records are doing to put a spotlight at long last on the Zim Heavy scene. We're going to have links to all of that greatness on our website, snapjudgment.org. That piece, it was produced by Pat the CD. Miller. See? We took you there, all right? But don't let out your breath, because we're paying a visit to an organization you may have heard of, the Ku Klux Klan. Mm-hmm. When the Shake, Rattle, and Roll episode continues, stay tuned. Support for Snap Judgment comes from Odoo. What is Odoo? Well, Odoo is an all-in-one management software with apps for every business need. Odoo has apps for CRM, accounting, sales, HR, inventory, manufacturing, and everything in between. And they're all in one easy-to-use software. And the best part about Odoo? All Odoo apps are integrated, helping you get things done faster and more efficiently. So when you think about business, think Odoo. To learn more, visit odoo.com slash snap. That's O-D-O-O dot com slash snap. Welcome back to Snap Judgment, the Shake, Rattle, and Roll episode. My name is Tim Washington. And today, we're featuring folk who are feeling the ground shaking beneath them. We're going to go back for a classic story from Snap producer Anna Sussman. It's one of those pieces that just sticks with you. It starts off when a good rabbi moves from New York City to Lincoln, Nebraska. I was uh, married to uh, Julie, and we went out there uh, together. 
The culture is really different than the East Coast. Uh, it's a little slower, and people are more reticent in that part of the country. But overall, it's a really pretty nice place to live, and I, I really didn't have any cultural adjustment to make. Julie and I had purchased a house, and we were moving into uh, the house and unpacking one Sunday morning, and we had a... Uh, a call from an unknown person. I picked up the phone and said hello. And he said, um, You'll be sorry you ever moved into that house, Jew boy. And uh, I did call the police and, and told them that I had received this threatening call. And uh, a few minutes later, a patrol car showed up and a police officer took a report. And he said that he thought he knew who might be behind it and uh, mentioned the name Larry Trapp. Larry Trapp had been uh, notorious in the community as a white supremacist, uh, hateful person. The police gave us instructions in a way, which was pretty troubling. They said, you know, tell your kids not to go back and forth to school in the same pattern. And a couple of days later, we received a package in the mail filled with about 50 or 60 items of racist material. Brochures, white power organizations, and there was one picture I remember in particular of Dr. Martin Luther King with a gun sight imposed over his forehead, and the caption was, Our dream came true. I think the most chilling of all, there was a business card in that package that was a Ku Klux Klan business card that had on the back of it, The Ku Klux Klan is watching you, scum. And that was pretty scary. So I called the police again, and they came and took all this material and confirmed that they thought it was Larry Trapp. But after a while, I started thinking that it might be a good thing to try to contact him. And so um, I got his phone number from a friend of mine who worked for the phone company. Uh, my plan was to see if he would talk to me. Maybe some good could come of it, or maybe I could just get it off my chest and say, leave my family alone. I dialed his number. When I called, I got an answering machine, and the, uh, the answering machine had a uh, anti-ethnic diatribe against Asian people. And it just went on and on and on about how the Asians are just ruining America and they don't deserve any better than the blacks and uh, the Jews and all of that. And uh, it was disgusting. And then I decided, well, I'm just going to call and leave messages for him. And I became, uh, I guess, a little bit uh, obsessed with the idea of contacting him. And so I'd call, and when it said, um, you've reached the Ku Klux Klan, white power, if you're interested in membership, leave your number. And I would leave a little message, which I started calling love notes. One message was, Larry, there's a lot of love out there, and you're not getting any of it. What's wrong with you? And I'd hang up. Another was, uh, Why do you love the Nazis so much? They would have killed you first because you're disabled. Larry Trapp was a double amputee as a result of advanced diabetes at a young age who lived his life in a wheelchair. After several months of calling, I, I realized that I was doing a pretty strange thing. I called every Thursday afternoon at about 3 o'clock. I had appointments with children for bar mitzvah lessons at 3.30, and so I called just before that. After a while, I think Larry Trapp figured out who was calling him. And finally, one day, Larry answered the phone, and he started yelling and screaming at me. Why are you calling me? You're hassling me. I can't say what he said for a family radio program, but I said, I don't want to hassle you, Larry. I just want to talk to you. And he said, what do you want to talk about? And I said, well, I heard you're disabled. I thought you might need a ride to the grocery. And there was a dead silence for a long time. And he finally came back on and said, uh, I've got that covered. But don't call me anymore. This is my business phone. And uh, Larry Trapp still kept getting calls from me at 3 o'clock on Thursday afternoon for another couple of months. And finally, on a Saturday evening, the phone rang. I picked up the phone, and, and he said, Is this the rabbi? And I said, uh, Yes, it is. Is this Larry Trapp? And he said, Yes, it is. I said, What can I do for you? He said, I want to get out of what I'm doing, and I don't know how. And I said, Would you like to talk about it? 
He said, yes. I said, well, I'll come over. I know where you live. So I hung up. My son stares and said, Dad, you can't go and see this guy. I said, yeah, I'm going to go. I'm going to pick up some chicken or something and go break bread with the guy. He said, you can't do that. When a Nazi wants to have you over for dinner, he means it literally. <laughs> but I did call a friend of mine before going, and he said, what are you, crazy? It could be an ambush. I said, look, if you don't hear from me by midnight, send the police. Do you know what I mean? And Julie and I got in the car, and we drove to his house and uh, knocked on the door. And he opened the door. He's sitting in a wheelchair with a Mac-10 automatic weapon in his lap and a shotgun hanging off the corner of the wheelchair and a pistol in his lap as well. And I said, oh, my God, we're dead. But instead, he reached out his hand, and I shook his hand, and he burst into tears. And he began taking these rings off his fingers, and they were two swastika Nazi rings. And he handed them to me and said, take these away. They've caused me nothing but trouble all my life. And we talked and talked about what he had been doing and why he wanted to get out of it and the uh, sort of childhood he had had, hiding under the bed so his father wouldn't beat him, which I'm convinced brought him to where he was in this hateful business. A constant tale of violence and racism and hatred and bigotry. He was doing this to try to make himself okay with his father, who was that kind of person. But he did it with a vengeance. I mean, he had gotten himself elevated to a position of authority within the Ku Klux Klan. He was called the Grand Dragon of Nebraska. Strange. So Larry Trapp uh, determined that he was going to live a different way that night. And uh, he asked me to take away all this literature and paraphernalia that he had around the house. Larry Trapp, he was not very old, but he had been sick a good part of his life. And he wasn't feeling very good one day, and he uh, was beginning to have kidney failure. Uh, Julie said, you know, maybe uh, we shouldn't abandon this guy, you know? And he's all alone in that apartment. What do you think about inviting him to come live with us? And so we moved him into uh, what had been our daughter's bedroom, and he was still functioning, you know, he was still living but living like with a family. Uh, Julie actually took care of him. Uh, she gave up her job in order to take care of Larry Trapp, who needed some care and attention. It was uh, an unusual time, to say the least. During that time, Larry Trapp started bugging me about wanting to become Jewish. And I said, well, Larry, come on, you grew up a Catholic. Why don't you just go to church? And he said, no. I had a miracle in my life, and it came from Judaism. I said, no, Larry, it came from you. I had friends in the Christian ministry, and I tried to palm him off on them, you know. And uh, Larry kept insisting he wanted to study Judaism. Well, we did have a ceremony uh, of conversion at the synagogue, uh, which Larry had been attending, by the way. He adopted Judaism and uh, lived the rest of his life in my house until one morning at about three o'clock he died. He lived in that house for nine months. It's almost like he went through that whole cycle of uh, birth again, and he died a better man than he lived. I was happy for him. His funeral took place at the uh, temple filled with mourners because Larry had done a lot of work in that nine months to try to make amends with people. And he was on the phone constantly calling people and apologizing and telling them he's sorry he hurt them. He spoke several times at the high schools against racism and he became a better kind of celebrity than he had been before. I felt like a member of the family had died. I think everybody in my family felt that way. You know, like everybody has a weird old uncle. He, he had become that guy in my family, you know? and well-loved.
Thank you, Rabbi Weiser, for sharing your story. The Good Rabbi now heads up the Free Synagogue of Flushing, where he continues to teach tolerance. That piece has original sound design by Leon Morimoto. It was produced by Anna Sussman. Oh yes, it's that time. But we want more stories, Glenn. More stories, well, Snap Judgment has your fix and you don't even have to go down a dark alley for it. Subscribe to the amazing Snap Judgment podcast you'll find there. Full episodes, some never broadcast on the radio. Get it on iTunes. You with the fancy iPhone, you have a podcast app on it. Hit it. Search for Snap Judgment. Hit subscribe. Now you're a technical genius. Tell somebody. But Glenn, I don't have an iPhone. Then figure it out. Stitcher, SoundCloud, it's easy. You've got this. I know you do. Snap was produced by the team that shakes, rattles, and rolls all the live long day. Please, pour a cocktail for the Uber producer, Mr. Mark Ristich. The cut created Pat Masini Miller, Anna, Too Fast, Sussman, Joe, Too Furious, Rosenberg, the magical Nancy Lopez, David Can't Kim, Go Go Renzo Gorio, Eliza to the Smith, Leon Morimoto, Tail to Cot, and Jasmine Aguilera for the three from the outside corner. And even though this is not the news, no way is this the news. In fact, you can dance in the mixed race dance club with all of your pals until the guys with the baton show up. And you have to pull a Von Trapp family and Edelweiss out the back and you would still not be as far away from the news as this is. But this is... P-R-X. Destination is the Reggae Club.